anyway. So, when a man gets the ligation of vas deferens, okay, vasectomy, is there still ejaculation? What do you think? Is there ejaculation? A man gets vasectomy. So vas deferens, right here, is ligated. Is there still ejaculation? Of course, yes. No sperm cells. So it's totally, like, infertile. So the point is, sperm that is produced, like, normal fertile sp sperm, contains sperm cells, which come from where? Hmm? Sperm, where does it mature? Testis. Yeah, testis. Well, yeah. Epididymis. Testis. And it contains secretions. Oh, sorry. Just one second. Mm -hmm. And it contains secretions from accessory glands, seminal, prostate, and bulbo urethra. Seminal gland produces alkaline fluid. Now, everything is important here. So the majority of seminal fluid. So semen that is ejaculated. It's basically cells in the fluid. Okay, so seminal fluid is 60% of it comes from seminal gland. Why alkali? What is the pH in vagina? Acidic. It's going to happen to sperm cells. Why it is acidic? It's pretty... Oh, not only bacteria, anything that gets in there will die because of the acid. So in order to protect sperm cells, seminal fluid is, it's like a buffer. It's like it neutralizes acidic pH in the vagina. Does that make sense? Fructose. What is fructose? Basic, huh? Why do I have sugar there? What's the main, what's the main uh, function of carbohydrates? Energy. Sperm cells got to move. They have a lot of mitochondria. So that's the energy source. Same goes for citrate. Energy source. Clotting factors. That's kind of unexpected. Why? Sperm coagulates in the vagina, so it doesn't drain. It stays there. Everything has a purpose here. Prostaglandins. Fantastic. Prostaglandins in the cardiovascular system, they stimulate, they actually vasoconstricting, they stimulate smooth muscles. In vagina, they stimulate peristalsis, essentially. Retroperistalsis that moves the sperm through the uterus towards fallopian tubes. Because otherwise it cannot get there. Okay? Now, um, if you saw like NCIS or other, that type of shows, they have that UV light, that they search for blood and semen, Seminal fluid contains the pigment that fluoresces under the uvula. Prostate. This one slightly acidic. Almost neutral. So it doesn't really affect pH of the um, seminal fluid that much. Again, citrates. Um... Different types of enzymes, um, like fibrinolysin, which is necessary to eventually kick in. Look at this. So sperm coagulates 
in, in the vagina and stays there for some time. But if it stays there as basically a clot, sperm cells cannot go anywhere. So after, I think, 12 to 24 hours, um, fibrinolysin breaks down fibrin, so sperm cells can now start moving. Does that make sense? It contains infamous or state-specific antigen of PSA. Levels of prostate-specific antigens are associated with, well, thought to be associated with the risk of prostate cancer. One of the components of prostate cancer screening for men used to be levels of prostate-specific antigen. Now, more and more, it is shown that actually it can be false positive, it can be false negative, so like if Somebody has low levels, it doesn't mean this person doesn't have cancer. Somebody has high levels, doesn't mean that there's cancer. It's probably something wrong, but maybe not, you know. Um, the function of prostate secretion is to activate sperm cells. And bulbo urethral gland is located right here, okay. So they're rather small. Uh, it produces mucus uh, during the arousal. It lubricates gland spinis, making um, copulation in the course easier. And it also neutralizes acidic urine. Remember we talked about it, the urine is slightly acidic, which is not good for sperm. So bulbourethral secretions help to neutralize it. Um, I don't have a, a special thing on it. I'll just mention it. Prostate cancer, second most common cancer in males after the lung cancer. Um, if it's diagnosed early, okay, so for prostate, what can, what conditions are associated with prostate abnormalities? One is prostatitis. Which is inflammation of the prostate. It's treatable, often um, not really active lifestyle. Okay. Benign enlargement of a prostate gland. Benign. So prostate gland becomes larger, and when it becomes larger, it squishes prostate urethra. So urination becomes painful. It's one of the first symptoms of prostatitis uh, and benign uh, prostate enlargement. And then there's, of course, prostate cancer. Four stages, as with any cancer. Third and fourth are invasive. Third stage usually associated with invasiveness in the surrounding tissues. Fourth stage is metastasis. Um, fairly easily diagnosed because it is often preceded by benign enlargement or prostatitis. For, I think, now the recommendation, regular prostate exams to 45, I think. Um, and it's, it's a manual exam. When doctor just sticks the finger up the anal orifice and palpates the prostate gland for its size. Best diagnosis. Early detection and treatment. Um, very high degree of remission income. Okay. There chemotherapy, uh, radiation therapy. So it's in the early stages, it's very, very treatable. Um, now, the problems associated with it can be related to erectile dysfunction. Now, the mechanism of the male sexual arousal are fascinating. It's just, it's great because you can see two systems, sympathetic and parasympathetic, working together. In females, the function of sympathetic system a little less noticeable. 
Here's the deal. So what happens in males? There are two separate responses. One is erection. Another one is ejaculation. So an erection, what happens? Parasympathetic response that results from sexual excite excitement leads to the release of nitric oxide from the endothelial cells in the blood vessels. That release leads to relaxation of smooth muscle cells surrounding blood vessels. That leads to vasodilation, that leads to the rush of blood into the uh, corpus spongiosum and corpora cavernosa, and engorgement of penis, which results with erection. Dilation of arteries and arterioles. Does that make sense? It's pretty straightforward. Sympathetic stimulation. leads to constriction of two things. One constricts the bladder sphincter. I will try to show it for you. So basically, uh, the bladder sphincter, you see uh, that's, the, that's the bladder, okay? And that's urethra that comes from the bladder. Can you see it? Let me erase it. I'll just So that's part of prostate urethra. Essentially what happens here, a little sphincter that constricts to basically prevent sperm that goes through the vas deferens and then ejaculatory duct into the um, urethra to prevent sperm from ending up in the urinary bladder. Does that make sense? Basically, that, you know, closes the way to the urinary bladder, okay, and the sperm rushes through the urethra. So basically, sympathetic stimulation leads to the contraction of smooth muscles that surround vas deferens, that surround urethra, that surround ejaculatory duct to push sperm out okay that's ejaculation now you can say wait a minute there are muscles participating in this yes they are but in this case ejaculation and erection two totally different responses they occur simultaneously then because basically the stimuli are pretty similar does that make sense so have two systems working together which is quite exciting now, um, male orgasm is absolutely unnecessary for reproduction, technically. So from a physiological standpoint, it's some weird chemical reaction in the brain. That's it. Um, drugs to treat erectile dysfunction, like Viagra or Cialis, are stimulating the release of nitric oxide. One of my favorite stories, really, in, in pharma is, I, I, just, I just love the story. It, the discovery was completely serendipitous. Initially, Viagra was a drug against hypertension. It was a base dilator. Really good one. They were about to put it in the market. They had that side effect. And the legend says it that uh, the CEO of Pfizer told his personal trainer that we have this weird side effect in volunteers. Like, it works fine against blood pressure, but they all get a boner. What are we supposed to do with that? And personal trainer, and think about this. It's personal trainer that works with rich people, rich males, in their fifties, and he looks at Pfizer soon and says, "Are you an idiot? It's a gold mine." And the sales were like in in tens of billions. So basically, we have like like top selling drugs. If you would look at the history, in terms of like short period of time, a lot of money made. Um, 
hormone replacement therapy until it was shut down in 80s, statins. Statins is probably the highest grossing drug ever. We're talking tens of billions of dollars. Um, and erectile dysfunction drugs, which tells you the sad truth about human priorities. Um, now, spermatogenesis. Before we talk about hormonal regulation, I decided not to torture you with meiosis. So I will, yeah, there, there will be like few very basic fundamental things about diploid versus haploid. That's it. It all starts with the diploid 2N. Can you see that? It's diploid. You know what diploid means, right? No? Uh, all your cells have 46 chromosomes. 23 from mom, 23 from dad. So that's diploid. Am I clear? So far, we good? So that's diploid. Spermatogonium, this one, divides into two cells. Daughter cell, which can further work for sperm production, and type B daughter cell. So type B cell develops eventually into still diploid 2N primary spermatocyte. We good? So far. Okay. Then it divides in the process of meiosis 1. There are two meioses. Meiosis 1 yields two haploid cells. Do you understand the difference between diploid and haploid? Now, if you will tell me that haploid cell has only chromosomes from mom or only chromosomes from dad, this is wrong. What happens essentially during meiosis 1? Imagine that you have a deck of cards and another deck of cards, two decks, okay? And they have different, how you call it, the, the, the other side. What's the word for it? Like the side where all the pictures are, huh? Now, there's a face and the back. They all have they one deck as like blue backs, another deck as red backs. So those are your chromosomes. What happens during meiosis one is that those decks are shuffled. So you have forty six cards in that double deck, and then you deal twenty three to each cell. Does that make sense? Each of these cells are going to have blue and red. Are we clear? There's going to be a little bit of more mixing I'm not touching, like crossing over and stuff like that. But the point is, at this point, genetic information is shuffled. Are we clear? Okay. So meiosis 1 is when that shuffling occurs. During meiosis 2, here, each haploid cell divides into two haploid cells. So now look at this. You start here. With how many diploid cells? Just one. Just one. That's the one. Okay? You good? Just one. It divides. It's normal mitosis, nothing fancy. Produces two diploid cells. You put one as the backup right here. And you use another one to make how many haploids? Two. And then in meiosis two, you double it. So from one diploid cell, essentially, here, you have four haploid cells. Okay? 
Does it make sense? And then those haploid cells eventually they will differentiate and will produce live functional spermatozoa. Okay? Does it make sense? So that's spermatozoa. Spermatozoa are haploid. Now, <clears throat> I'm sorry. These cells are surrounded by Sertoli cells. Now, the common question is, where are Sertoli cells on this picture? Do you see the yellow stuff on here? That's a Sertoli cell. It's weirdly shaped, so. This is all Sertoli cell. You see how weird the shape is? Do you see what I just traced? That's Sertoli cell. That's its nucleus. So Sertoli cells, they first nourish sperm during maturation. Does that make sense? Second, they guide them. They produce factors that help to guide sperm maturation. Are we clear about it? So far, we're good. And last thing, this here is the tight junction. This one. Here's the deal. If your immune system will see sperm cells, it will produce autoimmune response to your own sperm. You have to be isolated. So there is a really tight blood testis barrier. There's a those sustenticides, Sertoli cells, prevent blood from interacting with sperm. Now here, let me just finish it really quick. So this is seminiferous tubule. So essentially, you see those tiny little cells here? Those are spermatogonia. Those real, like, these tiny little cells. Those are spermatogonia immersed in the Sertoli cells. And as they mature, they end up here in the lumen of the tubal. That's where sperm cells are. Does that make sense? If you will stack tubes, think about just, you stack the tubes, that's like, like this. There will be space between the tubes. And that space are interstitial or Leydig cells. Leydig cells produce testosterone, which is absolutely necessary for the maturation of the sperm. And we're going to discuss the hormonal regulation of spermatogenesis on Wednesday. Okay, on your way out, please do not 